As we begin this series on the top 10 Bible stories in no particular order, we do this series because we in the Lutheran Church hold the Word of God in such high esteem and such high importance. And we continue to believe, as we have believed for over 500 years now, that the better we know and understand Scripture, the better we'll be able to live our life of faith in Jesus Christ. And so the stories that we are going to go over are some of the more important stories and some of the key stories that help us understand wider parts of Scripture and wider principles of how we read and study Scripture. There's a lot more than 10 stories, of course, but 10 weeks for a series is pushing it as it is. And so we begin with a story that we all know really, really well, right? It's the Christmas story. It's the story we return to every year. It is a story that is the most well-known in society, even by those who don't go to church or who don't believe at all. It is the story that in some ways our entire year organizes itself around, even though it's the, most, it's the second most important one. You could say Easter, the resurrection, is actually the most important story. And we know this story. We know this story because we've heard it a dozen times, and we know this story visually because of manger scenes. I'm willing to bet that in almost all of our houses there is some sort of manger scene, or we grew up with one in our house. My mother actually collects them. She has like a dozen of them from all over the world. And this manger scene is how a lot of people understood the Christmas story growing up. It's certainly the way I understood it growing up. But when we look at Scripture, what we discover is that this visualization is actually a mashup of two Gospels. In the Gospels of Luke and Matthew, you have different birth stories. Interestingly, in the Gospel of Mark and John, you have nothing. They start with the ministry of Jesus, starting with John the Baptist and Jesus' baptism. And in Mark, you go very quickly. And actually, if you can read at a fairly normal speed, you can read through the entire Gospel of Mark in about eh, 20 minutes. From John, you start with the baptism and you go to the death and resurrection, but you go a lot more slowly. You're going to need like a couple hours to get through John, especially the very weird speeches that just go on and on and on. But Luke and Matthew were interested what was going on at the beginning of Jesus' life as well. And they emphasized different parts of the story. For Matthew, Jesus was the fulfillment of God's promises to his people. He was the fulfillment of prophecies. And so constantly you hear in the Gospel of Matthew, as you hear in this section of it, as has been written by the prophet, or as the prophet said, referring to an Old Testament prophet, Jesus did this, or this happened. For Matthew, this was the global fulfillment of a promise made long, long ago. And so it's not surprising that we have some global characters in the wise men. These men from elsewhere, from the east, whatever that might mean. They follow this star, they see it as the sign of the true king of the Jews, and they come to pay Jesus homage. For Luke, we have a much more local take on the birth narrative of Jesus. We have Mary and we have Joseph. What else Luke emphasizes in his gospel is the way in which Jesus connects with the least of these, with the least important, with the least connected, with the least closely connected with the powerful and the mighty. And everyone in that story fits the bill. We know Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of God, God with us, Emmanuel. But for the people in Jesus' time and day, he is a barely legitimate child born to a teenager and the guy that she's not quite married to yet. And although it sounds great to say that Joseph is descended from the house of David, Let's take a reality check on that as well. Saying in Jesus' time that you are descended of the house of David is like saying in our own time that you are somehow a distant relation of Charlemagne. After that many generations, like half the world can connect themselves to those types of people. And while they may be connected to royalty in a distant way, they are by no means royal themselves. 
They do not have power. They do not have prestige. They do not even have the ability to get a decent room for Mary to give birth in. And yet they are the center of this story. Then enter your friendly shepherds, people who spend their day living outdoors, not bathing for long, long, long periods of time and having only sheep to talk to. These are not the witnesses you would choose to testify to the truth of the birth of the Messiah, and yet here they are. They are the least important laborers that you can imagine. They were often seen as rather untrustworthy people because, again, you spend that much time outside with only animals. Um, You're not to be trusted. And yet they are the ones who become central to this story. Because the stories are different, though, doesn't mean that one of them is more true than the other. It just means they're taking different perspectives on what happens. Think of an event from today's world, and if you took a local perspective or a global one, you would have different stories, different characters, different emphases, but you could still be talking about the same event and still be talking about it in totally honest and accurate ways. And both of these Gospels want to bring good news to God's people. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to start with these stories. These stories highlight something interesting about Scripture. We can read Scripture and get a surface idea of what's going on, right? There's a baby being born. Here's a mother. Here's a father. One of them, the baby is actually the son of God. There's the Holy Spirit. There's all these wonderful things going on. Oh, here's some wise men as well, and on and on. But what these stories show us is that not only can you do a surface reading of Scripture, but the more time you spend with it and the more time you study the context in which Scripture was written, the more you see. Think of a leaf on a tree. You stand from afar, you see a green thing hanging off a branch. Kids love to draw leaves because they're simple. You either kind of do a rounded shape with a pointed end or you do the more maple leaf shape. And there you go, you have a leaf. But if you get in close, you start to see the detail of what is going on in that little plant. You start to see its parts, and it becomes more and more complex. And if you dig, if you go in deep with a microscope, you see even more things on the cellular level that show you that this is no green object hanging off a branch. It is a plant all on its own, and amazing things are happening through the different parts of just one single leaf. Scripture is like that. When we dig down below the surface, when we zoom in with our own tools and our own microscopes, we see that even more is going on than we thought at first. So what is going on here in these stories? What is going on is we are being reminded of the people who are involved here. They are outsiders. They are not the mainstream of society. They are not the powerful and the mighty of their own time and place. They are not even important Jewish people, right? They are just some Jewish couple and these shepherds who knows what their religious background is and these wise men whose religion, whose faith, whose beliefs are unknown and untold. And yet they are key to the story. The most powerful people in the world at this time are who who Luke names at the beginning of his gospel, They are the governor, they are the emperor, and yet they are just names to mark the time period. They are not people in the story, and they are not central or important in this tale in any way. It is Jesus, Mary, Joseph, the wise men, and the shepherds who become the main characters. And that leads me to my second point of what's going on here. What we learn is that even the least important and the least powerful, and the least well-known can change the very world. We don't base our calendar on when Quirinius was governor in Judea. We do not base our calendar when Augustus was emperor in Rome. We base our calendar and the way that we count our years based on the birth of Christ. That's where the B.C. and the A.D., or if you want to be more modern, the B.C. and the B.C.E. come. It's marked on that time and that event. The event of a nobody from nowhere being born in the backwater of the empire. But that's the most important story 
that needs to be told. And that's the story that's been translated into hundreds of languages, thousands of dialect, and been spread all over the world. And it gives us hope as we continue to share that story, even if it's not with a ton of people. Now, we are not a small church. We're not a huge mega church, but we're not a small church either. We have somewhere between eh, 200, 250 people that come to church every Sunday. And on a good Sunday, we might hit 300. And we have a slightly larger presence than that online with our digital footprint and the videos we do and all the rest. And if we reach like a thousand people with a message across all our, our various ways on a Sunday, that's, that's amazing. That's only happened a couple times uh, since we've started doing all this. And I'm really happy with it. And I feel good about it. But then, then you start to take perspective and you look at what real online reach means and you realize that the work that we are doing here is nothing compared to someone like Jif Palm. Jif Palm is a dog, one of the most popular dogs on Instagram. He's a Pomeranian and they dress him up in cute clothes. He is adorable. I'm not going to deny that. But Jif Palm has nine and a half million followers on Instagram. That is twice as many as the entire membership of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Nine and a half million people go and see what this dog's going to be doing and wearing today. And you start to realize that the message we are trying to spread here is not even a blip on the daily radar of a Pomeranian. And yet, when we read the story, we are reminded of the hope that we have that we continue to do this work and we continue to share this story because this is the most important story we have to tell people. The story of Scripture, the stories in the Gospel, the story of God's redemption for the entire world in the person of Jesus Christ is the most important thing we have to tell the world. And because of that, even though our reach may not be far online or in the wider globe, we trust that this story will continue to be shared and continue to be impacted. And it doesn't matter whether it's to a thousand people online or across our phones and computers or whether it's to one little kid sitting in the Sunday school room with his teacher reading to him out of a book. We continue to share the story to any size audience. Because we know even though it's a small gathering, it makes a world of difference to those who hear it. The shepherds and the wise men, Mary and Joseph, and of course Jesus, made a world of difference to those who heard their story. And for those who continue to listen to the Christmas story and to all the stories we tell in Scripture, it continues to make a world of difference as well. And so we will continue to tell this tale. We will continue to share this good news. We will continue to tell the story of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, of the wise men coming to pay him homage, and of all the other stories in Scripture, because we know that those stories give life. Those stories give hope. And those stories show us how to live as children of God, and as disciples of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.